I will just refer to his uh, latest books, which are Power and Succession in Arab Monarchies, uh, Ling Rina uh, Publishers, which is specialized in uh, foreign policy and uh, strategic studies, and Faisal, uh, Saudi Arabia's King of All uh, Seasons by the University Press of Florida. Joseph is also uh, appears uh, regularly in, on uh, Matt Niedler, uh, on various BBC programs, and is uh, regarded as uh, a true specialist of that uh, area. Uh, he knows an amazing number of uh, languages, and what is perhaps more important, based on my limited experience with him, which goes back, I believe, to 12 or 13 years now, I haven't seen him for that amount of time, he is, I believe, a good man. And uh, today, uh, which is not common in academia, uh, today he will be speaking about Armenia and the Gulf states, foreign policy fundamentals and choices. This is actually a chapter uh, in an edited book that is coming out, edited by Manat uh, Tertarov, titled Gulf Russia CIS Relations. Uh, published by, uh, in Dubai by the Gulf uh, Studies Research Center in Dubai. So welcome, Joseph. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Stefan. Uh, I don't get a chance to do this very often. Since we are a small group, uh, we will get a chance to uh, exchange some ideas about this area uh, the Gulf states, which is very dear to my heart, and of course Armenia, uh, which plays an increasingly important role in the Middle East. This paper, as Stefan said, is 45 pages long. I'm not going to read it for you. It's coming out in uh, Mara Tepelov's book. Uh, what I try to do is try to, uh, try to do two things in this paper. And before I start reading the sections that I think are pertinent, what I try to do is show the legacy of Armenia in the Middle East. Everybody assumes that Armenia existed in the Middle East for a few hundred years, uh, and that the Ottoman Empire came and, and essentially put an end to Armenia's presence. Actually, Armenia's presence in the Middle East goes back approximately 2,000 years. And the, the huge kingdoms that were dominant in that part of the world, two major Armenian kingdoms, had a great deal of interaction with several of the nations of the Gulf states, which have today become independent countries like Iran and Iraq, and I will hint at some of these. So, what I plan to do is essentially concentrate on the introduction to talk about the policy fundamentals that the government is making, and skip the historical part. If you're interested, just let me know. I'll make sure that you get a copy of the paper. You can read them at your leisure, because it's available already. Uh, and then go to the Gulf states with the conclusion, we'll open it up for discussion and answer the questions that you may have. You may in fact have an opportunity for interaction. Because landlocked countries pursue survival strategies, geography determines the direction of their foreign policies, even if other contentions abound. In the case of Armenia, and except for its unique and privileged ties with Russia, Yerevan looks to neighboring countries in the Middle East as potential international partners and perceives all of the League of Arab States and Organization of Islamic Conference countries, perhaps with the exceptions of Turkey and Azerbaijan, I would say in the short term, not in the historical term, as recognizable allies. Yet because Armenia literally sits on Europe's eastern border with the Muslim world, it hovers between two poles. How it manages its ties with Russia in the north and the Muslim world in the south, and how it balances its pro-Western preferences with critical concerns that pertain to Turkey and Azerbaijan, probably will determine its long-term security. It's partly for these reasons that Yerevan looks closely to the Gulf states, where large and very highly productive Armenian diaspora communities thrive, especially in the past three decades. Over the very short period in the post-1991 independence uh, period, Armenia pursued a consistent foreign policy direction, even if its quest was severely handicapped by the conflict with Azerbaijan over Atsakh, which is widely known as Nagorno-Karabakh. 
Since 1991, the Armenian government has moved quickly and effectively to establish friendly ties with the outside world. Over 50 governments have officially established diplomatic relations, and several have signed privileged bilateral economic accords to serve mutual interests. In fact, many countries maintain embassies in Armenia. Now, of course, this might sound uh, repetitive and silly, but for a country that barely came out of uh, decades uh, of non-independence, I should say, something significant. Many countries now have ambassadors and chargés d'affaires accredited to the Republic of Armenia, and of course with representative representation, some of them have representation outside of the country. Yerevan in turn has established permanent representations in over 40 countries so far, as though it sought to coexist in peace with other nations. Out of necessity, Armenia addressed a strategic potential starting in 1991 as the USSR withered and Nasser republics gained their respective independence. To its initial post-independence leaders' credits, credit, Yerevan quickly embarked on a whirlwind of activity which gathered envy and scorn from foes and allies alike. Notwithstanding good intentions, the Karabakh Committee, which propelled several individuals to positions of authority, was ill-equipped to rule a state even if its attributes compelled it to govern a nation. Overnight, opposition forces were empowered to govern, and it was within such a context that its record must be assessed to better highlight accomplishments during the past two decades. With limited resources and operating under severe constraints imposed by a joint Turkish-Azerbaijani blockade on the landlocked country, Armenia struggled to keep its political cohesiveness internal security and economic stability. Despite harsh conditions, Yerevan managed it best as it was possible, and with respect to its ties with the Muslim world in general, and the Gulf states in particular, established solid long-term foundations. It drew Sukkor from its historical legacy, correctly assessed its unique attributes with a key neighbor like Iran, and I will say more about Iran in a second, and articulated a far-sighted message that was discerning. In that respect, contemporary Armenian leaders shouldered their responsibilities with poise and exercised their authority with distinction. To be sure, there were awkward moments, but such was the writ of foreign policy, whose burdens weighed heavily on those entrusted with protecting interests while promoting immediate concerns. Now, as I said, to better assess Armenia's contemporary relationship with the Gulf states, the paper that I prepared first highlights the country's historical legacy. It examines initial post-independence wars and identifies major contentions with Turkey. The discussion, it seems to me, was essential to illustrate Armenia's legitimizing influences over the past few centuries. Even if past empires withered away, Armenians maintained a continuous presence throughout the Muslim world for centuries which partly explained its contemporary outlook. And in the paper, uh, I next go through the uh, empire, how, how the empires rose, uh, especially uh, how the Armenian Empire clashed with the Sassanid Empire, the, the pre-Iranian Empire, if you would like, uh, and of course, what happened to Armenia after 1991. This part of the paper I'm going to skip. Uh, because obviously, otherwise we will never finish uh, in terms of time. 